Hey, Jeff, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. It's great to talk to you today, as I do almost every day. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a special day because uh, I've never had an opportunity to actually interview you before. So we have a, a nice excuse in because you're playing a solo that we're going to be putting on our series, um, our virtual series this year, 2020, a year like no other. Um, so we were talking a little earlier about, you know, special topics that we are near and dear to our hearts. And we're going to start today by talking about food, cocktails, movies, and Brit Box. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about all your experiences over the last couple of months with these things, some of the highlights. Well, I, I have been cooking a lot, I, as a lot of people have been, you know, we, we, uh, I make very few trips to the grocery store, and uh, I try to buy a lot of stuff at once, so I don't have to go a lot. Um, so I've been experimenting with some interesting recipes. I just made an excellent panna cotta, I thought. It was a really lovely panna cotta. Um, I think you tried that recipe, didn't you? I just made it yesterday. It came out beautifully. Isn't it wonderful? That's a wonderful recipe for panna cotta. Everybody Which loves it. Yes, and I, it reminds me of uh, easier times in Madison at Osteria Papavaro and having their fantastic panna cotta there. I mean, what a great restaurant. So I made that wonderful panna cotta. I've made some excellent cranberry pecan muffins that were somewhat elaborate, but really delicious and totally worth it. And my next big experiment, I am going to make Chinese hand pulled noodles. Do you know what those are? No. You make a, a dough and the the people who make these they 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 grab the dough and they pull it out. And then they fold it over and then they pull it out. And they fold it over and they pull it out. And by this process of folding, of pulling, you actually create the noodles. There's no cutting involved. No cutting at all. It's the, they're, they're delicious noodles. So how about movies, books and movies? Books and movies. Well, we have our wonderful little book club that uh, you and I have with our friend David Wells, and we're reading The Whale right now by Philip Hoare, I think is his name. Is that right? H-O-A-R-E? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really interesting book, sort of a combo of, a, a, an exegesis of Moby Dick, plus a history of the whaling industry and this guy's fascination with whale. It's a very unusual book, uh, but I'm liking it a lot. We're enjoying it. So uh, in terms of movies, I've been watching a lot of Brit Box. Uh, you got me into that. And especially Helen Mirren in Prime Suspect. Wow, so good, so good. And now I'm watching this series on, on BritBox called MI5. It's sort of a, like James Bond light, I'd oh, say. Okay. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, yeah. I, you know, after watching Prime Suspect, I went on to watch every single thing of Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine the Great in two different movies, one super young Catherine the Great and one older Catherine the Great. Both fantastic. Yeah, so, I watched, I watched the older one. I haven't seen the super young Catherine the Great. Oh, it's just, well, you will. I'm sure you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go on to talking about your experiences in the last two months of teaching on Zoom, because you have a lot of students and you had to mobilize so fast. What happened? Well, uh, it was in the, in the early part of March when we had, we started having our shelter in place orders out here in California. and uh, the the universities started moving things online and very quickly moved everything online. Um, so what that meant is that I had to do all of my piano teaching and all of my vocal coaching through Zoom. Now, that's hard. That's hard to do. Uh, what's hard about it is that, I mean, the platform itself is 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 pretty good for a lot of things, like what we're doing right now. But for a music lesson, it can't transmit the quality of sound 
that you need to hear to really give the best possible advice to your students. And the other thing that is really, really difficult about it, students often don't have great internet service. I teach at two different schools. I teach at the University of California at Berkeley. Most of the students from there, but not all, most of the students there come from relatively advantaged families and they have pretty good internet service at home or wherever they're living. The other school where I teach is California State University, East Bay. It is the most uh, ethnically and socioeconomically diverse campus in the continental United States. The only campus in the United States proper that is supposed to be more diverse is the University of Hawaii. Huh. Uh, so, so I, I have a, a huge range of students of all ethnicities that I, that I teach there. And many of them come from relatively disadvantaged families. And, and many of them, I'd say most of them, are first generation to go to college. A lot of them have really substandard internet connections. And if you have a bad internet connection, trying to get your college education on Zoom is... I, I, I think I would have given up. I mean, if it had been me, I would have given up. I, I have to salute these students. They really did everything in their power to make this work. They rallied their forces. They went to extraordinary lengths sometimes. Sometimes students had to connect on their telephones using the cell network rather than using, you know, real internet. Um, but they still showed up. They tried to get things done. They were there. It's, it's amazing, you know, the disparities in, in the situations, in living situations, have made a huge difference in learning outcomes for students right now. And I, I, saw, I saw that every day of teaching for the last several months. You know, we were, we were talking earlier about um, just how little you and I know about Black composers, for example, who wrote classical chamber music. And there probably aren't that many, but there are probably many more than we know about um, for all those reasons that you just cited. And, uh, and of course, I was very struck last fall when um, Rachel Barton Pine came in and played solo violinist with the Madison Symphony and talking with her afterwards, um, we all discovered that she has a foundation that she started in Chicago specifically for um, researching violin pieces by black composers oh, and wow. amassed a huge collection and she's got you know she's gotten money now and she's gotten a staff to do this research but I'd really like for us to you know sort of dig in there and see what we can find that might be appropriate for our for our festival um, but also you were mentioning about Dvorak and Dvorak's student tell our listeners a little bit about him well um, that's really interesting about Rachel Barton Pine, and I, I, I'd really like to investigate that for sure. Um, one of the things that, that has always struck me, uh, when Dvorak came to the United States in the late 1800s to teach at a newly opened conservatory, the American Conservatory of Music in New York. He was, at the time, um, you know, one of the most famous composers in the world. And it was a real coup for this new conservatory to get him to come. Um, well, one of the things that he did when he arrived, he, he didn't have the, the longstanding prejudices that many Americans had, um, perhaps in part because he himself was a member of a largely oppressed ethnic minority in Europe. I mean, the Czechs and the Slavs were historically very much downtrodden by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Very much historically, that's, we know that to be the case. So a very oppressed minority. In fact, uh, for a long time, Czech was not allowed to be spoken. It could only be spoken informally. It wasn't allowed to be used in any sort of um, official capacity even though it was the, the native language of, you know, millions of people. Um, anyway, so Dvorak comes to America and he doesn't have the same kinds of prejudices that many Americans had. And so he uh, took a strong liking and strong interest in 
the native music of America. Now he thought that the the black music that he was hearing, the the spirituals, were native American music. He thought that because he didn't know much better, but my point is that he accepted that as a completely valid means of expression, a completely uh, valid genre. And he accepted students who were students of color. Students of color had never been accepted in America's music schools. And one of his most famous students was Harry Burley, the first black student to study at an American conservatory. Uh, and Harry Burley went on to make beautiful arrangements of spirituals that are sort of in a kind of a classical style, but very, very fully composed, kind of like Bach composed elaborations of church melodies, of hymns. Um, anyway, Dvorak was uh, just very interesting that way. He was also very interested in actual Native American music, the music of the you know American Indians, so called. He's always, you know, quoting what he believed was a Native American music in his own work. There's mm -hmm. plenty of that in New World Symphony. And he loved the Black spirituals, as you said, and he used those. He, was, he, was, he would grab everything from everywhere he could and filter them through his own musical sensibility to make whatever, you know? And I think it's interesting you say that about Black musicians, about him not having that prejudice because certainly later on in the 20s, 30s, 40s and on, black musicians, primarily jazz musicians, just moved to Europe, you know, because nobody was prejudiced against them there. They had a marvelous life in Paris and other places uh, where it just didn't exist. So um, Harry Burley, I'm sure I'm gonna learn more about him. And that conservatory was what was going to become Juilliard, that first American conservatory. So I think, I think there is a relationship between the American Conservatory yeah, and what and Juilliard. Yes, yeah. there is. And um, okay, so well, we're going to be finding out more about all these things. And and I mean, uh, thanks, Jeff. Okay. I, so interesting. It takes a foreigner to come here to recognize the value of what is here in this country. I mean, it's kind of like you know uh, Alexis de Tocqueville <laughs> coming in and observing. <laughs> American democracy back in the in the early 1800s, and, and it takes his book, his writing, for people to realize here in this country what's actually going on. It's it's very a very bizarre phenomenon. Huh. That's great. That's a great analogy. <laughs> so okay, just to wrap this up, tell us about the piece you're going to play today. Well, continuing in our little Bach series, Bach lunch. Um, I'm going to be playing two movements from the Partita number no. four in D major. I'm going to be playing the Almond and the Courant. This is uh, one of the six partitas that Bach wrote around uh, 1729, 1730. And the set of six partitas is actually Bach's very first published piece. It is his opus one. Bach didn't publish any of his music. People didn't publish their music back then. It was a very expensive process and very little music got published. This he considered to be one of his very best pieces that he had ever written and he went to the trouble of publishing it. Uh, so that says that he thought quite a lot of it. The two movements are really beautiful. Uh, the Allemande is I think one of his most um, expressive, profoundly beautiful movements. And the Courant is in a, in a very French style and very rhythmically fun and very upbeat, very uplifting. So it's a nice contrasting pair, very spiritual, soulful, thoughtful, very uplifting, fun, and, you know, funny even at times. So. I mean, I know it's going to be beautiful. I can't wait to hear it. Well, we should probably sign off now, and I can sign off with our old slogan, which is right behind your head. It was our very yes. first poster that we ever had at Bach Dancing and Dynamite, and it was our slogan, fantastic slogan, that was composed by uh, the folks at, uh, well, kind of like by me and the folks at Lindsay Stoner Briggs. It says, what Bach would be doing if he were more fun and less dead. That was our slogan. That was our slogan when we started. Talk to life again this summer and a composer who we love so much. So thank you, Jeff. Looking forward to seeing you soon.
Yes, and you too. Bye. Bye.